Both the Grand Historical Society is delighted to present yet one more of our lecture series. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our major sponsor, Hazeltine Nurseries. They have been advocates of the Historical Society for many, many years. And without them, we wouldn't be able to produce these outstanding programs. And now it gives me just great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Kaylee Stokes. Kaylee has spent a good part of her career conducting oral histories, and that's what brings her here today. She is going to share with us excerpts from some of the interviews that she has done with our former Black community members of Boca Grande. Haley also uh, is a assistant director of student success programs at New College in Sarasota, Florida. She spends much of her time when not at New College preparing oral histories and also talking with families across the Gulf Coast through her company, Story Root Productions. I think it's amazingly appropriate that Kaylee's with us today as we present our program in the midst of Black History Month. So Kaylee, welcome. Please share now race, power, and memories. Thank you so much for that introduction, Woody. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So like Woody said, uh, my name is Kaylee Stokes and I'm gonna be talking to you today about uh, the oral histories that I did with members of the black community um, on Gasparilla Island. Now, some of you may be wondering who am I and why am I talking to you today about this? Uh, I'm pretty young, I'm white and I've never lived on Boca Grande. So you could be forgiven for wondering. Uh, so before we get started, I actually think it's important to share a little bit about myself. Um, and so the first thing I'd like you to know is that I actually graduated from New College in 2016, and I spent my final year there um, doing research on the history of Boca Grande and tracking down and interviewing members of the Black community that had previous lived on the, previously lived on the island as part of my thesis. Um, and I loved that project. I got to meet five incredible narrators who lived there. In fact, I think one of them is in the audience. I think I saw Jacqueline uh, Cotman join us. And so um, you'll get to hear some of her story today. Um, the other thing to know about me is that I am the co-founder of Story Roots Productions. And we uh, work with families and nonprofits across the Gulf Coast to help them really capture, um, share, and preserve their stories for families, their future generations, and stakeholders. And then I think possibly the most important thing I'd like for you to know about me as we start this talk is that I'm someone who really firmly believes in the power of stories to connect us. Um, so this photo is actually a, a photo of me and some of my family in England. And the man all the way on the my left <laughs> or on the left um, is my great uncle, um, Jack, and he's 97 now. Um, and I got to meet him because of an oral history project I did a few years ago. And the crazy thing to me is I never probably would have met him um, or learned about him if I hadn't have really fallen in love with oral history. But beyond connecting us with our family, uh, stories have the power to really connect us with folks who we otherwise maybe wouldn't have, um, folks who maybe aren't like us and gives us the power to learn from them um, and learn from their experiences. And I hope that uh, some of that happens today um, during my presentation. So my talk is really uh, going to be split up into three distinct parts. And the first part is going to be a very brief history of the development of Gasparilla Island and Boca Grande. And this is a much more traditional kind of way of looking at history. It's very document based. Um, and this is going to hopefully provide some helpful context for the next uh, piece of the talk. And so then we're going to talk a little bit about the limitations of working with history in a strictly document based way. Um, and we're going to talk about how oral history can really contribute um, and add to our historical narratives that when we include oral histories and personal histories, they become richer um, and I think more interesting and I also think a lot more valuable. Um, and so we're going to introduce some new characters to the history of Boca Grande and you're going to get to hear directly from them um, and I'm going to play some audio excerpts from my interviews with the folks that I interviewed. Uh, and then the final 
shortest piece of my talk is going to be at the end where I'm going to share with you what I hope are going to be a few takeaways that you take from my presentation um, today about how the personal can is historical. And I want you to think about your, your story as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, you can't talk about Boca Grande without talking about phosphate. Um, and the story that I'm going to tell you today is going to start in 1899, which is when the American Agricultural Chemical Company, that's a mouthful, uh, or the AACCO, was created by merging 22 smaller previously existing companies. Um, and the AACCO was in the business of phosphate, and it and its subsidiaries would play a driving force in the development of Boca Grande um, and Gasparilla Island in general. So an important character here is Peter Butler Bradley, who in 1900 was elected as the director of the AACCO, and he was made responsible for um, securing phosphate-rich lands in Florida. Um, but Bradley was a pretty savvy business guy, and he knew that if the AACCO wanted to remain a, a dominant phosphate producer in the state of Florida, it needed more than just the phosphate-rich lands, that it needed a port facility where it could um, receive, uh, load, and ship out the materials that it was mining. And it would also need transportation to get the materials to that place. And so he really set his eyes on Boca Grande um, and they secured the land. Um, so Boca Grande at the time was the deepest natural port in the state of Florida. And so in 1905, construction began on the northern end of the island to build a thousand foot long loading pier with conveyor belts to load the ships. Um, in 1906, Peter Butler Bradley became the president of the AACCO. And a year later, the AACCO took over the Manatee and Gulf Coast Railway, which later became known as the Charlotte um, Harbor and Northern Railway. And this allowed them to transport the phosphate to the loading docks and then load them and ship them up. So they really had control of all aspects of the phosphate production at this point. So by 1911, the phosphate loading facility is up and running. And by 1913, Florida is producing 82% of the US's total phosphate. <laughs> um, but again, Bradley was a pretty savvy businessman. And so he had, before even the first train arrived um, on Boca Grande, he had set his sights on expanding the Boca Grande for more than just phosphate. Um, and so he had really plans that extended beyond that. Uh, and he saw that because there was beautiful beaches, as you well know, um, and incredible fishing. And so he really wanted to develop the island as a high end um, winter resort, sort of following in the footsteps of Jekyll Island in Florida. So the Boca Grande Land Company is created as yet another subsidiary of the AACCO. Um, and in 1911, the Boca Grande Hotel is opened, um, which then becomes known as Gasparilla Inn. Um, and sorry, I need some more. <laughs> so that becomes known as the Gasparilla Inn. And Peter Butler Bradley was really following the footsteps of Henry um, Flagler and Henry Plant, who both had large hotels at the end of their railroads in Tampa and Miami. Along with the railroad, um, they also built a casino, a golf course, and housing for domestic workers, uh, all with the aim of helping attracting uh, high-end visitors and seasonal residents. And it worked very well. The hotel was booked to capacity every season, with many of the regulars choosing to purchase their own land and build private properties. So given that uh, there was abundant fishing in the area, as well as the recent development of ice plants, they saw another opportunity for profitability um, in that they could actually ship iced fish to, this was a newer thing at the time, that they could ship iced fish to cities across the South and the Northeast. Um, and so the Charlotte Harbor and Northern Railway built fish houses plus homes for the fishermen and their families to rent out. And this later became known as the village of Gasparilla. Um, the other good thing about it being this kind of multiple, uh, sort of multiple industries on one island 
was that many of the commercial fishermen supplemented their income by working as sport fishing guides during the tourist season. So there's a nice picture of a big old fish. Um, but we know that uh, Boca Grande is no longer a functioning port. It no longer ships out massive amounts of phosphate. And so we will talk a little bit about um, how that came to be. So in 1947, more than 730,000 tons of phosphate um, were shipped from Boca Grande. Um, in 1969, Boca Grande was named the fourth busiest port in the state of Florida. But only a decade later, in 1979, the phosphate port was closed because much of the, sh the shipping was being moved to ports in Manatee and Hillsborough counties. So today, Gasparilla Island remains a popular high-end destination um, and home to many second homes. But it also has this incredibly rich and unique history um, where these vastly different worlds converged on this small little island. So in the Seven Long Mile Island, you had it was simultaneously home to a thriving fishing community, an elite vacation destination, um, the largest phosphate shipping port in the country and the labor community that came along with that. Now, the history that I just shared with you about the development of the island, it helps us have a better understanding of the timeline of the development and the context of the development of Boca Grande. I also think that it's interesting and I hope that you do too. But I think it's also important for us to recognize that it's limited. It's limited because I'm only talking to you for a short amount of time. So I'm having to pick and choose what's important to share and how to share it. It's limited because my decisions are also decided by the decisions of historians before me of what was deemed important to document and preserve um, and share. And it's also limited uh, because it's largely a history where the characters are corporations and government. So it doesn't tell us a lot about what day-to-day -day life was like on the island. And it's almost entirely silent on the black community whose labor was really the backbone of a lot of the tourist and phosphate industries uh, that let the island thrive. So for the rest of my talk, I wanna bring some of that story to the forefront and really allow them to tell their story in their own words. And that's really the magic of oral history. But also before I get started with this, it's again important to recognize that this history is limited as well. So it's limited by the fact, again, that I had to make decisions about what to include and share in a short amount of time. Uh, having to cut down 120 pages of transcripts, uh, it's limited in that by the time I started my research, many folks who had lived on the island in this community had already passed away. Um, and it's also limited because, again, by the time I started my research, there hadn't been a ton done to document this community. And since they had moved off the island by this time, there was difficult to track them down. Um, so I was only able to interview five members of the black community in the time frame of my project. But I hope that their words and their stories helped to begin to fill some of the previously existing gaps. So for nearly three quarters of the 20th century, black residents made up between 25 and 30% of the island's year round population. By the year 2000, uh, they only made up one half of 1%. Now this has slowly crept back up and um, the black population on Boca Grande is just under 5% of the year round population. Um, so when I started my research on Boca Grande, I went to the, Boca Grande, the Port Boca Grande Lighthouse Museum, which is fabulous, um, but they only had a single uh, panel featuring the African-American community that had lived on the island. Um, and on this panel, there's a photo featured of a group of kids eating watermelon and it was surrounded by quotes such as, we had separate communities at South Dock, but there's no discrimination. There's real community feeling. Given the time period that we were talking about and the fact that the black community on the island was almost non-existent by the time I visited, I thought there might be some more to this story and I was interested in adding a little bit more context. So I set out to interview um, members who had grown up on the island to learn more about what life was like for them. And what follows is the result of those interviews as well as additional research. So you'll be hearing from sisters Florence Jokes, Carolyn Rouse, and Jeanette Washington, uh, as well as Johnny Johnson, who is the son of J.D. Johnson, and Jacqueline Cotman, who is a niece of Mayola Nixon, who was the teacher for the Black school for a number of years on the island. Um, together, these stories tell a history of the day-to-day -day life on the island of this community. 
So black laborers began moving to Gasparilla Island at the beginning of the 20th century, and they worked as railroad laborers, dock workers, fishermen, and construction laborers. You're going to hear from Florence Jelks and Jacqueline Kaufman in this next clip about their dads. My dad, uh, who was Booker T. Washington, grew up there too. I think he must have been about 12 or so when they went there because he started working for the company. Of course, he worked for the Seaboard Railroad Company there for 53 years. Uh, he started as a little boy at the powerhouse and he moved and worked himself up to a, I would say a long showman. Um, yeah. But I do know those ships were coming in from all parts of the world and he was foreman of the black uh, community. And if the ships came in ahead of time, no matter what time of night it was, someone else would come and get him. He was employed by the Seaboard Coastline Railroad, but they had to do with phosphate. He ran a machine shop. Okay. okay. Machine shop, and he was a loading farm. You had to make stuff. You know, you couldn't go to Walmart or Kmart and that, you know, you had to make that stuff. Make it by hand. He made hand handmade knives and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? He made all kind of stuff. And uh, you know they load them ship. Them ships come from China, you know, to Japan, wherever case. <laughs> maybe. Back in the day when that phosphate was, you know, shipping it out. Oh, the other thing I, I like to make people laugh about. See on that island, there were ships coming in from Greece, Japan. It's everywhere picking up phosphate to take back home. And they would always come into the quarters. But when they came in the daytime, we would always, if you hear them coming, someone say, here come the shipmen, here come the shipmen. And they just walked through the quarters, blah, blah, blah. And they were doing a different language, whatever they were. And we would be walking right along the side. No, no, and pretending that we were <laughs> That was crazy. <laughs> but then at night, yeah, at night, they would come back looking for tubs and things. To, so you had to put up all that kind of stuff because they'd steal it and take it back overseas with them. Isn't that something? Yeah. Rub bowls, scrub bowls, everything. You had to put it up. So the railroad and dock workers on the island made fairly good money, but they worked long and hard hours for it um, and often in dangerous conditions. In another interview, which I don't have the audio from um, as it was done with Thomas Philpott and Robert Johnson through the Historical Society earlier. Um, Thomas shared uh, stories about injuries that some of the employees got while working on the loading docks, including a fatality. Um, but this is Johnny Johnson and Carolyn Rouse talking a little bit about what the working conditions were. 24 hours straight yeah. and eight hours off. Oh they made plenty of money. They, they probably can get them for $3.50 an hour. They work day and night, seven days a week, seven days a week, loading them, loading them ships. But the people were not speaking out during that time. You know, my dad was afraid to say anything, really, because they were saying him, you know, he was so good, you know, and they said, oh, you're so good, you should have been a white man, you know, but that kind of thing was not, you know, to be said. In the early 1900s, the Boca Grande Land Company um, began to also develop the island to attract high-end visitors um, to purchase and build homes. And they knew that the lifestyle of, of these visitors would really require domestic workers and, and landscape um, workers. However, there wasn't a bridge built that connected the mainland to the island until 1958. And so during this time, anyone who worked on the island also had to live on the island. Um, and so here's a bit about some of the maids that worked there. My aunt had the key to Miss Crown and Shields mansion and she would open it up for her when she'd come from the north and then she'd be the one to close it down and keep the key. She used to work, you know, she, it's a maid, you know what I mean? Work with the DuPonts and Sharps. The housing built for the Black community became known as the Seaboard Quarters and was a mixture of single homes and attached homes referred to as longhouses. Florence talks about her childhood home on the island, and here's some photos that Jacqueline provided with me um, with, from her family home to go along with it. 
It was a four bedroom, a four room house. I, I wish it was a four room house. And uh, the rooms were about as large as, uh, just a little bit bigger than my kitchen. kitchen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just always, there was a stove there and a table and some shelves on the walls. And then we had uh, three other rooms. And uh, one of them was, was uh, for my baby sister. And my middle sister and I slept in the, what we call the living room. At night, it became bedroom. And my mom and dad was in the other room. And then it had a back porch. And that's the little porch I said I would go outside and look to see. It wasn't anything, uh, nothing to brag about. But it was a place, you know, and my mom made it. She was a, she was a good mother, yeah, so she made it a, a good loving home to be in. Johnny Johnson, who you'll hear from next, lived in the Seaboard Quarters around 15 years after Florence Jocks and her family. You had uh, no toilets, no uh, hot water, and uh, you, had, you, had, you had to make what do. Back in them days, you had to make what do. I, I used to stay up late night with my BB gun, days of BB gun, shoot, shoot the mice. We had... Uh tanks, water tanks. And I and I think about this now because the water tanks had screens over them. And we drank that water. Now can you imagine the ships were just uh wasn't even a half a mile from us with all that phosphate that was blowing back over and blowing into that water, you see, into your drinking water. I think about that now sometimes. And yeah, that was bad. That, that was bad. bad. That was really bad. Scary when you think about it. That was how we got our water. Religion played a large role in the Black community, and there was a Baptist and a Methodist congregation, um, but they had to share a single church building. And Florence Stokes talks a little bit about that process. They, they had church, it was so small. So the Methodist church had first and second, first and third Sundays, I think it was. And the Baptist church had second and fourth Sundays. And I switched over. Yeah. But we would um, practically go to all of them. Where we went to everybody <laughs> with each other's church. We just went from did. one church to the other one. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> There was also a commissary on the island run by the railroad company, um, and employees would keep a running bill, like a running tab as they, as they um, purchase things from it. And sometimes kids would use this to their advantage. So Florence tells a story about her sister, uh, Jeanette, doing just that. But the commissary was sponsored through the seaboard, and so you just had a bill there. So we were accustomed to just running up, uh, asking for a soda, or asking for an apple or whatever you wanted, and just put it on the bill. And it's just gone. My sister did. I always tell this, my baby sister, he named her Soda Water because she loved soda. <laughs> and sometimes she'd go up there and take her little friend and she'd buy them sodas. So one day she did, she got a run up a big tab for soda. Then. She had a good little spanking for that because <laughs> my mom had been telling her to quit. Don't do that. Don't do that. She, yeah, so we got in trouble about that at times. There was also a barber shop and Fred Lee's juke joint, which Florence is going to talk a bit about that. Just a little bitty place, and he had a space about as big as in there yeah, like that you could shop. dance if you wanted to. Oh, really? And a piccolo in there. Well, wouldn't you know? <laughs> we were dancing off of more Frank Sinatra and all of them records than you can ever imagine because all of the, the black records, he took them downtown to the white folks. <laughs> the record man did. He didn't drop them off there. <laughs> so we were black kids dancing off of white folks music and thought we were having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time before we found that out too. 
<laughs> laugh about things like that. Now. Oh, my sister, true. we laugh. So, yeah, we'd be dancing up some Frank Sinatra. And, who was it? Uh, some other guys. They were they were real popular. But the, but the Motown music. These guys who were just coming up. You know, just beginning to get their thing going. That went over on the other side. <laughs> So Fred Lee of Fred Lee's Juke Joint was the only black man to actually own land on the island. And though he left the property to his wife and son, Howard, when he passed away, Howard lost the property a few years later when he defaulted on some loans. Uh, this was a source of sadness and anger um, among many of the people who I spoke to. And Thomas Philpott, in his interview with the Historical Society and with Robert Johnson, Except expressed his frustration um, about not being allowed to purchase land on the island at the time, despite having the money. Um, well, you see, everybody looked at me and I stayed black, but I wasn't stupid, is what he said. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about school on the island. Um, so Isaac Washington, who is Florence Jelks's grandfather, moved to Boca Grande shortly after development on the island began, and he had 14 kids. So he decided he wanted to take uh, the lack of educational opportunity on the island into his own hands. And in 1915, Washington hired Minnie D. Harris from Arcadia to teach his children as well as the other children living in the quarters. My granddad, back to that, he had so many children. He had about 14 kids, so he had a, a, a school. Somebody gave him a little house out in the pasture that was right across from the quarters, where we called it then. And uh, he got a teacher out of Arcadia. Wasn't a teacher. I think it was just someone who had probably finished 12th grade in those days. If you just finished 12th grade, you could teach. And he hired that young lady to come over for his children and the other children in the quarters. Unfortunately, this original attempt uh, at providing an education for the Black Island children was interrupted only three years later and didn't begin again until 1925. So originally the school had been held in space rented from the churches on the island. Um, but when it began again in 1925, a building was rented from the Seaboard Railroad Company for $25 a year, which is the equivalent to about $370 in, in today's money. Um, shortly after the school began, though, Mrs. Louise DuPont Crown and Shield became involved and raised money to build a school building. Um, and Mrs. Crown and Shield raised $1,200 from the wealthy families living and visiting Boca Grande. Another $100 was raised among the Black community themselves and an additional $400 in public funds was provided, as well as a $200 um, donation from the Rosenwald Foundation, who was doing a lot of work at this time, building um, schools for African-Americans across the South. Um, so with the equivalent of just under $30,000 in today's funds, um, construction began on the schoolhouse and it was completed in 1927. The school was a one room schoolhouse with a bathroom and attached living quarters for the teacher. And Mrs. Crown and Shield bought books for the school as well as funded hot lunches for the students. The school taught up to eighth grade with a row for each grade. And Miss Mayola Nixon was the teacher. You may have two kids in eighth grade. You yeah. may have three in the third grade. You might not have any in fourth grade. The rolls like one, two, yeah. three, and then you have separation. Maybe the third and fourth grade was over here. And we could talk across each other, <laughs> and you know we did. <laughs> but it was fun. It was such, it was so really fun. But we learned a lot. All of the holidays were celebrated at the school. That they did. Neola did cake walks. Then she'd have the Halloween um, apple bobbing contest and and those type things. And we used to go picnicking on the beach at the school. We every year at the end of the school, that was a ball. Now that was one that we always lived for. Was the end of the school picnic. Well, everybody cooked food, and we set up, uh, built those little booths out of palmettos and stuff, and. Uh, We'd have a lot of food out there, and we'd be out for school that evening, that day, most of the day. And we'd just be out on the beach, and I would bathe in suits and eating and having a good time. That was our closing out the culminating for the years. 
So while in the younger grade, school was a great source of community building, um, continuing an education on to high school proved to be a source of disruption and disconnection for a lot of the students. So the black school only went up to the eighth grade. And while there was a school on the island, that a high school on the island, um, it was a white school only. And so black students who wanted to continue their education through high school had to actually essentially move off the island um, during the week to attend school because there was no bridge connecting the island to the mainland. Um, and so Johnny Johnson will talk a little bit about this. Because, you know, after you leave uh, graduate from the eighth grade, you got to go to the ninth. Yeah. So you had to move off the island, right? Mm -hmm. School in Arcadia. I stayed with my grandfather because my dad had built a house over here in, in uh, Sarasota. Ninth grade, I went to school in Arcadia with my granddad, and from 10, 11, and 12 at Booker. Leaving for school is still an incredibly difficult memory for Florence Jelks, but it's also one that she's contextualized in her life story as a great source of strength and inspiration for the decades of work that she did as an educator in immigrant communities in Immokalee. Um, I want to play the full excerpt um, of her experience here to really capture that, even though it's a bit longer. That's another story. Yeah, let me let me go into that one and talk about that because yeah. that's always it. it it's uh, sometimes I think about it, it gets depressing, and then again, I said it made me into a strong woman. So yeah. I grew because of it. But it it, it it's a uh, when I finished, you know, I told you I had to leave early, a year earlier, because uh, the teacher said she felt she was holding me back, so she wanted me to go on, leave. And I did. And I left, uh, went to, I skipped eighth grade and went to ninth grade. And uh, I was living that year with her mother, and she had married uh, the teacher there was married to a cousin of mine. Okay, okay. so it was sort of like a family, family thing, member, yeah. mm -hmm, family member. And um, I would leave home every Sunday evening to catch that two o'clock uh, little satchel, the train called it, little satchel, going back to Fort Myers, so that's where they lived. But then I would have to go to a place called Murdoch. So the train went right through them, but they would put me off at Murdoch, on, and, and I had to walk about a block from the little train station, which was no more than just a little stand with a top on it, like you see the bus stops now. Yeah. And then I'd have to walk about a block over to 41 to catch the bus. So I had about an hour long they're sitting on my little luggage suitcase, <laughs> waiting on the bus to come along every week. And that was on a Sunday. And I and, and so I go to school all that week. And then on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, I had to go back to Fort, catch the bus from Fort Myers, go back to that same spot, Murdoch, get off, go back to that little station and wait for the train to come through around 12. Pick me up, and I'd go back to Boca Grande. So you could have and one I, day with your Yeah, I'd have one day with the family, enough time for my mom to wash my clothes. And, do. and, and you know, at my age, I'm sitting there on this suitcase because people weren't bothering you, and it's, it's hard to even imagine now that I'm sitting there every weekend waiting on the bus to come by and pick me up. So I did that for a year. And I guess that's why I have a lot of empathy for my migrant children here and why I've stayed with them so long. My second year, I had to go. I had to move to Arcall, a little place close to Arcadia. Fort Arcadia, you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because wouldn't you know that the crazy cousin of mine, he started acting up and so the teacher put him out. <laughs> And I told you that was a family deal, so I couldn't go back there to Fort Myers. I had to move to to Hall, to where my granddad was, and and uh, and stay with them that year. So, and what what happened then? It was the same situation. And I'd catch the train that morning, that Saturday morning, 
probably be about an hour earlier, and then go to Boca Grande, stay over till the next evening, Sunday evening, and back again. I had to walk about a mile to get catch the bus to school every morning. <laughs> and it would be, I think about this, it would be wet sometimes because I had to go through the groves. So I had to take extra shoes and stuff because I'd be soaked by the time. And you know, when I think about it now, I'm just, I think about all the white schools that I passed because when I left Boca Grande, I left the white school right there. And when I was in Hall, what I did was pass another white school going to Arcadia. To a school, you see, in Fort Oakland, passed another one. And that was for four years. I've that went on for four years, you see. So that was a mess. It was a mess. It was a mess, a mess, a mess. So attending high school was difficult and really only possible for Black Island families who had family on the mainland who were willing to host their kids during the school week. Um, but for the students who were able to make it through the four years and long travel days of living away from their families, they were able to attend college for free, thanks to Mrs. Crown and Shield. Um, Mrs. Crown and Shield promised to pay for the college education of any island child who was accepted and enrolled. Um, both Carolyn and Jeanette's undergraduate degrees were paid for by Mrs. Crown and Shield, who they often referred to as their fairy godmother. Um, Florence Jelks won a separate scholarship and received a full ride to, to Florida A&M. When we went to school in college, you always had to bring your grades back and let us see them. <laughs> she was paying for your college. She didn't pay for mine, but she paid for my sisters. Anybody who left the island and went away to school, she would pay for their college. It wasn't that something. Talking about a fairy godmother, but she was. Why should have an education? She would give you, she paid yeah. for your education. That, that's why I think we're so honest. I don't want to brag on ourselves. But she would give us a blank check to come right up to the family. Yeah. And we would have nothing on us. But her name, Francis B. Crashy. We could have given any amount of money that we wanted to, to write in that check. Okay. But we didn't take the advantage of that. But we wrote what we were supposed to write, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, so all three sisters went on to become educators with multiple degrees. Um, like I said, Florence worked uh, in Immokalee with immigrant communities for, for decades. Um, and I know that uh, Carolyn Riles owns her own uh, copy center up in Tallahassee. By the 1960s, there were fewer and fewer railroad and shiploading jobs available on the island. And since the bridge had now been built two years prior, uh, domestic workers could now live off the island and commute to the jobs that were left. Because of all this, Sunset Realty now um, saw the land uh, that the quarters were on as incredibly valuable um, for future development. And so it, around 1960, Sunset Realty evicted the Black families that were living there and tore down the quarters. Um, a small community called Tarpon Pass was, Estates was built on the south end for the people who had been evicted. However, this housing was even more substandard and in the 1970s condemned after repeated flooding. Um, though it's been decades um, since everyone who I interviewed had lived on the island, everyone remembers their childhoods incredibly fondly and with great nostalgia. Each of them reminisced with me about the days gone by and how much they loved growing up on Boca Grande and how lucky they felt to have that experience. The side of the Charlotte Harbor Bay and the bayou ran it right up to our uh, the back doorsteps and you looked out over at the Charlotte Harbor Bay and then the pier, the dock where the ships came in, in with the phosphate was there but I can remember going out on the back porch one morning looking out across the bay wondering what in the world was beyond all of that water over there and how someday I would like to go uh, across it and see what was waiting there. 
Mm-hmm. How little did I know that I probably would have been so much better off by staying where I was. But I've had a wonderful life. P- grass huts on the beaches. We live, you know, no far than right, you know, the other side of the road. Oh, yeah. yeah, we, you know, waterfront property, you know. Yeah. Now it costs you, shoot, Jesus Christ, all my, I don't know how much it is, but lunch break, everybody else played basketball, we went swimming. Had an hour off, you know, we went out to the beach. Beach was right across the road. We went swimming. That was a beautiful time. We ate really well. We yeah. ate really rich food. We ate all kinds of fish. And then my mom would fix crabs and stew them, fry them. You know, we had them barbecued any kind of way you can think of. We had them shrimp. Anything you wanted to eat from the water, you had it right. <laughs> I think about that when I go to uh, some of these food places and we have to pay so much, I say, oh, I wish, I wish. We didn't know how rich we were. I tell my sisters all the time, we grew up as little rich girls because we had all of the swimming we wanted to do. You know, the beaches on, on one side was the uh, Charlotte Harbor Bay and then on the other side was the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we could go either way, you know, and we had uh, all the seafood and sea grapes and just everything that a poor man could want. We had it. And, uh, and that's why it, we, we knew it had to be rich because where I lived now, there, you know, there are no, no more blacks or anybody that with money, without money can live there. The rich folks are living on the very street I was born on. So there's a couple of things that I hope that you take away from my talk today, um, besides obviously connecting with these narrators um, and learning something new about Boca Grande's history. Um, and one of those is that I hope that you challenge yourself to think about history differently, um, to ask and question what gaps exist in the historical narratives that you're presented with, um, to think about whose experiences, stories, and voices are included and whose aren't. Real history is not a static objective retelling of the inevitable. History is a culmination of actions and choices of individuals that move us toward one direction or another. Um, History is complicated and messy and our collective narratives are full of contradictions that get to coexist. Um, So even in what I shared with you today, you know, Florence Jelks and her sisters remember their childhoods on the island with incredible fondness and nostalgia and pride. And they share their experiences with segregation and racism. Um, Education was incredibly difficult and disruptive. And it was an incredibly empowering and opportunity for them. It's when we acknowledge the messiness of history um, and really explore these contradictions that we learn not just what happened and who we were, but who we want to be and who hopefully we can become. Um, So I really invite each of you to think of yourselves as a historical agent, as an individual making choices and taking actions that not only move you, but move us um, in one direction or the other. And along the same lines, I also want you to think about the importance of recentering the personal in the historical um, and understanding that it can bring value and meaning and lessons to our understanding of the past. Everyone I've interviewed for pretty much every oral history project I've done um, expresses some hesitancy and and questions if what they have to offer um, is helpful or valuable or meaningful. Um, But clearly these personal stories contribute greatly to our understanding. Um, So I challenge you to think about your story and where it fits in. Um, And I also challenge you to share your story with others because it's only by understanding Um, where we've each been that we're actually more likely to work collaboratively to get to where we want to go. Um, Mm -hmm. I'd also like to give special thanks to all of my narrators and folks who I was able to interview. So Florence Jelks, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, her sisters, Carolyn Rouse and Jeanette Washington, uh, Jacqueline Cotman, who many of her personal family photos are used in this presentation, as well as Johnny Johnson, uh, shared many of his photos and then all the folks at the Historical Society who were there when I was doing this research, as well as the Fort Boca Grand Museum and Lighthouse. Um, 
Yeah, so thank you. Any questions? Haley, thanks so much for that rich presentation. And also your work has pres preserved forever a part of our history that would never have been known had you not taken the time to find those important people, interview them, gain their confidence and leave the record for the rest of us. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions in just a second. But first I want to ask you two quick questions. First was, how did you, what motivated you to take on this project in particular? You hinted at it at the beginning, but I'd like to know, okay, what, what set you off on this, on this um, trail? Yeah. Um, so I actually had done an oral history project with um, another woman, my, my third year of college, Beverly Hargis, who was a white woman from Boca Grande, who was now living in Sarasota. And through working on that project with her, um, much of our conversation was about her childhood growing up on Boca Grand, and again, just how much she loved it and how magical it was. Um, and so my research for that project with her brought me to the island and talking to the, the historical society and the museum. Um, and I just became very fascinated. You know, it was a place where when you learned about it, you wanted to learn more because <laughs> it has this very rich um, and complex history. Um, like I said, you know, you had a phosphate industry, a fishing village, uh, you know, high-end resort and a labor community all in this tiny little seven mile island. And so clearly they probably have some good stories. Um, and so that got me interested in, in doing more research on, on Boca Grande's history for my thesis. And then when it came to narrowing down what I wanted to do, I didn't want to just research what, you know, what existed in the archives, but I wanted to hopefully contribute something um, to it. And so through talking with, um, the museum about what they thought would be helpful and also just my own interest. Um, I settled on the, the black community, so. And finally for me, the question, what were there surprises for you as you took up this project and had these rich interviews? Yeah, um, two, two surprises. Uh, one was just how difficult it was to find people. Um, so, uh, you know, there really hadn't been a lot done and people had moved off back in the 60s. Um, and because the communities were so segregated, there wasn't a great track record of who all had lived um, in the African-American community. And so I really, um, Thomas Phil Pot had already passed away by the time I started researching. And so my really only uh, starting point was Florence Jelks. And then I was able to find the other people um, through her. Um, so that was definitely a surprise, just the difficulty of that. Um, but then the other surprise was just how incredibly gracious everyone who I interviewed was, like willing to spend their time with me and talk to me and share their stories and um, just very open and, and willing to share. And that was a very pleasant surprise. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to open it up for questions from our gallery. Uh, if you have a question, could you raise your hand? And then obviously unmute yourself. Uh, Kelly, I have a question for you and for Jacqueline. Uh, I'm wondering how much memories changed over the years, uh, especially for Jacqueline. Uh, they were uh, born in a certain time and interviewed in another time when the civil rights movement had just uh, begun to get started. And now, of course, we, you know, they might have an entirely different uh, memory of these times, or in, at least uh, interpret the memory differently. I wonder what, you're, what, what you've observed, Kaylee, and, and if Jacqueline's still there, uh, what she thinks. Yeah, so the interviews were, were done in t between 2015 and 2016. Um, and that's something that I actually go into in my thesis a little bit about, because um, that's part of oral history, right? Is understanding that our memories um, are impacted also by the, the time between when they happen and when we retell them. Um, and so there's a section in there where, um, you know, when I first interviewed Florence Jokes, the, the Flint water crisis hadn't yet, um, that kind of broke as a story. Um, but then when I interviewed her sisters, um, a few months later it had. 
Um, and that understanding of that current thing that was going on also affected our interview when they were talking about the water tanks, right? That they were making that those um, current connections. Um, and so that's something that I go into a little bit more on um, in my thesis, but I'd love to hear if Jacqueline's willing to share. Jacqueline, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, my reflections would not change simply because I was reflecting on the actual period in time and what knowledge we had as, as a young person growing up there. Um, I would not um, entwine the social issues of that period had, if I had not actually experienced that. And so I did not experience uh, racism there. We were living in that community. My father was a foreman and everybody had a job. All the men had a job. My mom was a FAMU uh, graduate. And, uh, but my father's cousin was already teaching at the one school. And then he had another cousin, uh, the Delaney's, uh, that our, our uh, relationship in bloodline goes back to the 1800s. And then my auntie Irma was married. My dad's uh, older sister was married to um, Mr. Will Robinson, William Robinson. And uh, they lived there too. So we had kind of like a family grouping. And um, I left in the, I think the fourth grade, I was at uh, J.R.E. Lee in Mulberry. And then the year after we moved to Tampa, my, but my dad stayed there until he died. 1964 working. So all of my memories would be about maybe two or three years. And um, I, I do, we do have friends who are still alive who live there, my parents' friends. And uh, there was one younger uh, girl who's on one of the pictures, both she and my younger sister have PhDs. And I doubt that they remember anything because they were so young. And I have one brother, Reginald, younger brother, who uh, was a year old when uh, my parents left there. So he, he remembers absolutely nothing. And Victor, now Victor was on at least three of the photographs that were shared of the children, him uh, laying in bed and then standing, uh, drinking something from a straw with uh, two other girls. One was my sister and the other was Catherine. And so, I gave the actual experiences of, of what was going on with us. And that's not very much because, you know, we were so very young living there, but everybody was kind, everybody was nice. And Miss Damajean Delaney was the one who would take us to the beach and we'd go swimming. We could all swim underwater. And she would stand and watching because those waters were shock infested. And if she saw one, she'd say, shark in the water, and you could hear underwater. So we'd run out. And the thing that I remember about it, we did not get back in the water that day. And I don't know if the sharks would have remembered and come back again, but we didn't <laughs> know. And she never lost any of us. So I was always reflecting on my actual experiences with the people who lived there and everybody seemed always so nice. I remember Carolyn, I don't remember Jeanette and Florence too well, but I remember being at Florida a &M as a sophomore and Carolyn came to my dormitory and delivered me a big box of goodies. You know, the students enjoy getting those goodie boxes from home. It had come from my auntie Irma who had a second home in Arcadia. And because Carolyn was coming uh, maybe back to school or whatever, she asked her to uh, give me that box. And almost everybody in the sorority room ate from my box <laughs> that day. So that's how I remember Carolyn. And I never saw her again. And, you know, I really hate that. But that's kind of the way life goes. You never see the people again that you, you know and who you encounter. But uh, my mom didn't like it because she was a college graduate, didn't have a job, but she was having us, you know. She was still having babies. And um, 
she uh, taught school when we moved to Tampa. She got uh, first got a job working with Carnation Milk. She was a consultant. She had been a home economics major. So she was a consultant for Carnation Milk until she got a job uh, teaching. They say it used to be very difficult to get a job teaching in Tampa if you were not born uh, in Tampa. But she waited it out and she was able to get a job uh, teaching. So we had, we, I just had a great time here. You know, I think about all of the, the fun that we had. We always had something to do, um, especially with the trains coming in with people coming off. And my, uh, once I was sitting on the back stoop, and I've written about this, and um, there was a gentleman and a lady coming down uh, the back road, and he had a camera, and he gave me this camera and had me take a picture of him. Well, I did. I never saw that picture until about 15 years ago. I was doing the research for my family history, and my mom gave me over my dad's a service album. And there this man and woman, the picture of them was right in this album. I did not know who they were until I did more research. He was the man who they called the father of the Harlem Renaissance. Dr. Elaine Locke was who he was. He died maybe two or three years after that photograph was taken. I would never have known who he was. And uh, now I'm wondering why was that man there? Because he was he was the third PhD from uh, uh, third black to receive a PhD from Harvard University, and the PhD was in um, philosophy. He was a um, Howard University philosophy professor in D.C. before he passed, before he retired. So it was just thoroughly interesting to try and find more information during that time. I don't know where they stayed the night, if they lived, stayed the night, because I remember the, him saying, where will we stay? You know, I had no idea. I must have been about five years old. <laughs> and um, so if, if he stayed at the schoolhouse where I know uh, my cousin Mayola and John Nixon had an extra room, I don't know. But I just remember, you know, all of those little little uh, things. And uh, I tried to uh, give the reflections as much as I can. And I did uh, get to speak at a Boca Grande um, event uh, during Black History Month one year after I had published a book. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I stay tuned to everything. Enjoyed meeting Kaylee. She came up from Sarasota while she was still a student. And uh, we, I took her to lunch downtown St. Petersburg. And we had just a delightful time. I keep her book. Um, I've enjoyed uh, reading the reflections of Florence and the others. Florence, by the way, was the godmother of one of my mom's great nephews. And I did not know that. Had I not been doing all this research, I would not have found that out. So they, they really enjoy each other in that little town of Immokalee. And yeah. uh, I've enjoyed all of this work that Kaylee has put together in preserving the history and the lives of those important black people who lived on that tiny island. It's amazing. I once asked my mother, well, when there was a storm approaching, did you have to leave? She said, you certainly had to evacuate. So those are the little things that I ask her, you know, before she passed. This Kaylee, is wonderful. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Thank for, you. Um, thank in, you. Inviting me. And it's yeah. just, it's, no, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great to, to know that someone cared this much about the people who lived there and worked there. But you know, phosphate, I'm just finding out how important phosphate was. Yeah. Uh, Kamala Harris, our vice president, new vice president of the United States, wrote in her autobiography that she had met Bill Gates at a cocktail party. And he always enjoys talking about phosphate. And she asked him why. It's in her book. He says, because everybody in the world, almost 80% of the people had to rely on food. And that phosphate made sure 
that the food was developed. And so that's why it was so significant for Zora Neale Hurston and Elaine Locke and those other black writers and then Kaylee now to really cement and preserve the lives of those people. It was an important business. She did a great job, didn't she? She did, she really did. Um, I'm so impressed. Well, what you've added in your question is also rich and uh, are there other questions in the audience? I'm wondering how difficult it was for Jacqueline's mother to get her degree. Oh, uh, my mom was the youngest of four children and she was the only girl. Um, her mother lived at Pierce. Now Pierce is where the superintendents of the phosphate industry lived. And uh, by my mom having two older brothers at Florida a &M, they were AA degree graduates of Edward Waters. First leaving that phosphate town, mining town, to go to Edward Waters to become ministers because Edward Waters specialized in that during that time. Well, this was the late 30s. They were so good as athletes and they were quite smart. They were offered scholarships to Florida a and by coach um, Alonzo Jake Gaitha, the legendary coach. In fact, my mom's older brothers had the first two scholarships offered ever in sports. And she had one uh, cousin, Georgia McDuffie, who was offered a third. And then another young man who lived at Pierce with them. They were all graduates of Union Academy High School in Bartow. And so once they got to Florida a and my uncles recruited my mom because she was such a basketball star at Union Academy. And, uh, you know, it only cost like uh, $22 a month to attend school back then. And my grandmother, her mother certainly could not afford to send her to school. So what happened was by Uncle Jimmy being older, my mom, he graduated and he married a marvelous lady from uh, Jonesville, Florida, not far from Gainesville, on Gladys. Uh, Gladys was teaching in uh, Ocala uh, in Williston. And my Uncle Jimmy was the principal of the Williston School. And so he was making $44 a month. And my Auntie Gladys had him give half of his $44 a month as a principal to Florida a and to keep my mom in school. And that was how she graduated. Now he told this story himself because I didn't know it. He told it at my mom's retirement party in 1995 over in Tampa. And we all just marveled at that because my auntie Gladys was just a a very kind hearted woman. She was a home economics major herself and had a master's from Cornell University. Her undergraduate was at AMU. So they were, she was the one who was making all the financial decisions. My uncle was just so smart that he enjoyed working. In fact, he's the only black to ever become chairman of the Florida Board of Regents before it was, uh, long before it was abolished. So I'm wondering if you should, Kaylee may need to interview again. You have such rich additional <laughs> material so, to be so shared. That's how, that's how mom got to go. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank uh, you so much for sharing. Um, other good. people who have questions. Yeah, I wanted to say something if I could. David Fox. Sure. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, you know, I can't thank Kaylee Stokes enough for uh, doing this paper. I mean, it's, it, this would have been history lost had mm -hmm. she not done this. And uh, really important work. I, I read Kaylee's thesis and uh, it is fascinating. I couldn't, I couldn't stop reading it. And, uh, and I want to thank Jacqueline Cotman too, because uh, you said that most of those photos were hers, Kaylee? Yeah, a lot of them were, were hers. Um, and so wow, really, really. Yeah, she had done a great job of kind of preserving her family's history. And so yeah. she had put together a book um, yeah. that included a lot of those photos. Really, really great stuff, Jacqueline. Great pictures. And, um, you know, there are, 
there was so much in here that I, I just didn't know. I did not know it. And uh, despite, and, and something else that made me think about this too, you know, there, there may have been segregation on Boca Grande, but the, the whites and the blacks got along tremendously, really. We, and we all took care of each other. Indeed, my, my great, uh, not my great uncle, but my uncle Billy Wheeler, when he first got there in the 1930s, he used to uh, work with J.D. Johnson and they would um, hand line those, the, that, that fish that that young boy was sitting on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, that was a, that's called a Goliath grouper. Now they used to be called something else that we're not allowed to say now, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but that's what they used to pull up by hand line, hand line, he and JD Johnson. So, you know, we all work together. And I think that that, that made a big difference despite the fact that, you know, there was a segregated school and the churches were segregated. It was still, we yeah, worked together. Sorry about that, that photo. So that's actually Johnny Johnson with that big fish. Is it? And yeah. And the, the funny thing is I actually used that photo with, um, on my previous project, uh, when I was doing research in Boca Grande before I had met him because yeah. it was online in the Florida Memory Project. And so I go out to interview Johnny Johnson and he pulls out his album of family photos <laughs> and that one's in there. And I'm like, this is you? And he's like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, so good. That was a nice little serendipitous. Uh, and and just, as, just as a little side story, um, uh, you know, even the, even the bars were segregated. And, um, but... And uh, Frank, Frank Smith, who owned The Temptation, he, uh, he had a back room there called the Caribbean Room. I guess it's, still, it's called the Caribbean, Caribbean Room now. It's where people eat. But it's where uh, the blacks used to go drink, and uh, like Blue Brown and, and some of his buddies. And it was an honor. I, I recall it being an honor when I was asked to come in there and have a cocktail with them. And, and so that was sort of, that just gives you a little feel about how we, the interplay. The yeah, inter and so that, that's terrific. definitely one of the, the limitations of my work is because I, I started this, um, everyone who I was able to interview from this time period that I was looking at were, were children um, when they lived on the island. So that's why most of what you hear is from Florence Jelks because she really lived on the island through high school. I mean, only for one day a week through high school. But um, she had the most memories of, of growing up there. Um, but yeah, definitely missing that sort of adult worker experience. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, and Florence Jokes, you know, she's she's a hero for yeah. for going to Immokalee and and working with those migrant children all those years. Yeah, she was an incredible if woman. You're not familiar right? with Immokalee, it's it's uh, it's a tough place. Yeah, so when I went to visit her, I walked into her house. She had been an educator her whole life. Um, and I walked into her house and her living room walls were covered in photos of her students um, throughout the years that wow. she had um, worked with. And essentially, she had basically informally adopted many of them as well. Um, and she referred to them all as her children. And I, when she passed away, I actually went to her, her funeral and she was so clearly a beloved woman. I mean, it was standing room only in this very large church. Um, and so she, she was, she was incredible. Oh yeah. 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 Big respect, big respect. Anyway, thank you. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Kaylee. So much. I remember, I just want to say that I remember meeting uh, Mrs. Crown and Shield in her mansion. And I also remember Mr. D.D. Chastain because he gave me a bracelet upon graduation from high school. He sent it uh, by my by one of the relatives, and um, I still it was a tennis bracelet, and uh, I just the people were so nice. And there was one man who was Bo, and he was the one who would always come by our house to get my dad if he if they needed uh, the foreman, and but I can't remember Mr. Bo's last name or if that was his real name. Mm -hmm. So you know if anyone is ever asking who was Bo. <laughs> you know? So he was the one that uh, would come by the house late at night if, my, if they needed him. If a ship came in early, then Bo was the one who would tap on the door. It looks like we may have a question in the chat yeah. room. Producers, oh. can you help me with that? 
Well, I, have that... a I have a question if I could ask good, it. Good, good. Um, and you may not have this um, information because the interviews, as you noted, were of children on the island, but I was curious about uh, back in those days, law enforcement and crime and, you, you know, if this was more of a Mayberry, there's really nothing going on there. If there was any law enforcement even on the island, if there was any crime even on the island. But I, I was just curious about that and how that might manifest itself. Yeah, really? I'm not fully totally sure about that. Um, someone else who, was, who maybe had lived there would know. Um, the only crime that I heard talked about was... Um, the, the people who coming off the ships kind of stealing stuff um, in the black communities. Um, but I mean, I have to assume it was such a small island and the community really relied upon each other to a good sense that um, there was kind of that sense of, of that. But I also have to assume, you know, small island, everyone knows each other. There's probably some drama too. But <laughs> well, I mean, was there even like one police officer on the island? Yeah, I don't know. David, do you know? Yeah. There was, uh, generally there was one, the Knight brothers, one of the Knight brothers, or my uncle Duane, uh, and generally there was just one. There was no, there was no crime to speak of. If you bought, I mean, we used to leave our keys in the ignition of our cars, and people would take your car, and then two or three days later, they'd bring it back, <laughs> but they'd bring it back, but it had no gas in it by the time oh. <laughs> That was my question. <laughs> anyway, other questions? Uh, hi, this uh, is... What, any others? Oh, good. Cornelius Ward. Um, at the Historical Society, there is a, a, a public broadcasting video that was done about 25 years ago, which is superb. Anytime we have guests on the island, we, the first thing we do is show them that video. And for those that haven't seen it, um, I know they sell it at the Historical Society but they also will show it to you on the uh, video screen there. It's fabulous. Thank you. Good information. Any other questions from our, I know we're starting to lose people, um, but not for lack of interest. Any Hi, other questions? Uh, there's a, a story about uh, clientele at the temptation that people might enjoy. Uh, blacks used to order food to go and they could, uh, also buy a bottle of uh, booze. Uh, now the white customers at the front of the restaurant uh, could not buy their drinks, uh, could not buy a bottle. They had to buy by the drink. So they asked the ownership, uh, how come they can buy a bottle, which, you know, cost them less, and we have to buy by the drink. And the owner looked at him and said, because you're the wrong color. <laughs> great <laughs> great any other questions um because i think yes, we're... I que yes i have a question hi Hello. robert hi just in light of in light of black lives matter and the racial injustices over the years and obviously some so many people who lived here on the island were unable to have a great education or economically economically be sufficient in their lives. Is there anything we can do today to make a stand or make a statement in light of the, the national movements going on today to, to speak up and support some of the people who have suffered over the years of these children and grandchildren? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You can get involved in your local um, organizations. You can donate. You can, again, seek to who? out. To who? To whom? Uh, that'll be up to you, um, but you can look in your local community. Black Lives Matter, they have local chapters. Lots of ideas. Yeah. Um, but, well, you to know. me, this is a perfect example of how you donate and do things to let Black people know that you care. Black Lives Matter. It's very simple to me, but, you know, I, I've had lots of, of um, time to, to think about this. But I think it's the most marvelous thing in the world for you, the Boca Grande Historical Society, to allow Kaylee to talk about the lives of Black people who live there. 
Well, Black it, history it, matters too. Yes, yeah. yes. And that's what I'm talking about. Black lives matter through this history. And you are certainly doing an excellent job of helping in that, that light. Now, that may not be politically charged like some of my friends may like it, but that is the way I feel. Yeah. I don't feel slighted at all. So Bailey. part of it is lifting up the voices of others, seeking out the voices of others. Again, sort of questioning where the gaps are um, and also understanding that this history, we carry it with us today. Um, and so, you know, that difficulty in accessing an education or not being able to buy a property on the island, those have impacts today in people's lives. And so um, there's a comment in the chat about um, really the economic upliftment um, as well. And so I think that that's a really important piece, piece as well because um, these people are still alive, um, clearly. And so it's also recognizing that the effects of this continue today for many. Um, Thank you. Well, I, I hate to wrap this up, but um, I know that Kaylee, who has been here, may return again, I hope, if she does some further research. And so uh, again, Whitney, again, does yes, Jim, I think Jim was maybe raising a, I didn't. I don't see the full gallery. Oh, Tom was too. Okay. <laughs> oh, now I see the. Voila! If you look in the chat room, you'll see the you you'll see the link for Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and also some other comments in the chat room are offering resources in answer to Robert's suggestion. Ready? Ready? Jim. Jim Blaha. You might mention the. You could even point to them, the books now that we the data collection books. Uh, on, I was inspired by like, when I originally became involved with the historical society by the abstract, uh, and so we have created a total of five volumes on the black experience on Boca Grande. The first, they're 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 what I call the data collect on-site data collection notebooks. Mm -hmm. And there it's a collection of articles, letters, uh, the abstract, the thesis. And then uh, we have researched through the United States census and other records and identified, we think most of the black residents who at one time or another lived on Boca Grande, and I have a page of information for each one of those people. I think there are over 400 in, in total. So we have five volumes on the Black experience in Boca Grande. Yeah, and that's been so Jim, thank you so, yeah, Jim, thank you so much for mentioning that. That's what I was holding up as one of your five excellent notebooks. Kaylee, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're totally fine. Um, that's what's been so incredible to see is um, since I started this project to now, how much has been done to kind of go back and collect that history and share that history um, with the folks who do visit the Historical Society. And so that's been really rewarding to just kind of see that. Can Pam? I say one more thing? Oh. Yeah, say uh, this Pam? is, I was gonna say, and then, then David can follow. This is clearly meant to be a start, a first, um, and what Jim and Rosemary have been doing in, in collecting the hard data and putting it in notebooks, and now this program with Kaylee, we clearly want to continue to explore this whole aspect of island life, which historically was not given the attention it needed and deserved. And uh, so long term, stay tuned because there will be more. David? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that... Uh, I remember now why there was not much crime on Boca Grande. Uh, if you were not from Boca Grande and you had done something wrong, you were unceremoniously taken off island. But if you were from Boca Grande, we, and Betsy can say something about this if she wants to, there used to be a jailhouse there. And all it was was a little concrete block house by the side of the railroad track down there by 4th Street, wasn't it, Betsy? I think so. And And... They threw you in there and it had bars on the windows and bars on this little bitty door. And, but it had no screens and it was right by the mangroves. And they put you in there overnight. 
And if you got eaten by those mosquitoes, which you would, you never did any crime again on Boca Grande. <laughs> All right, um, Betsy, did Betsy. you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I do have a, a question. If if you have any more information about Fred Lee's and about the quarters that are uh, located on Palm Avenue down to Fred Lee's, if any of you that are speaking, we are searching that. I remember that as a child. Um, Carolyn, I'm Betsy Fugate Joiner. I'm sure that we probably know each other from some time or other. I stay in touch with, with Paul Williams uh, from time to time and have been wanting to get uh, Johnny, Paul to bring Johnny down so that we could actually interview him at the Historical Society. So if there's any way that we could work on that, we'd love to do that. Yeah, I've been trying to get back in touch with Johnny. Um, I, I spoke with Johnny a month ago. Uh, um, this is Jim Blaha. I spoke with, I called him. I finally got his phone number and I called him. And, another... Uh, and sorry, he, another he, he, sorry, come, Jim. Come down to Boca Grande. Uh, he's uh, has some medical challenges right now, but he he wants to come back. He does, yes, and share some more experiences with uh, with us. And and just to comment about what uh, Betsy has indicated, we are able to find a lot more material about the black community which existed at the south end of the island, whether it be in the quarters or at Tarpon Pass Estate. But there is, a, at least for us thus far, those of us who are doing research about the Black experience on Boca Grande, um, we cannot find a lot of material about the Black community who lived east of the tracks, east of town, uh, be, between say what, first, uh, on first street down to the uh, east, and and then Palm, right? That's in, in that area, the juke joint, right. for example, that existed somewhere around First and Palm towards the dam, where the dam was. Sun, Sunset was. Realty developed that area. They, right. they Sunset Realty developed that whole area where now there are canals and everything. But that was the Black Quarters when I was a child, and most of those families worked in the community for the wealthy people, what we call beach runners. There was that community and there was the port community. Tarpon, Bay, Tarpon Estates came after. Well, if anybody has photos or more information about the black community, which Betsy referred to that lived east, uh, east of the tracks, uh, please contact us. Thank you, Jim. Um, and... Kaylee, a couple of people through the chat room have wanted to get access to your thesis. And obviously, Jim has it in a notebook here. But we can also, those of you who've asked for that, uh, if you're in touch with us at the History Center or Kaylee, um, we can yeah. get you to Kaylee. Yeah, so um, the History Center currently has a physical copy of my thesis, but I can also send a digital copy um, that you can share with, with anyone who requests it. Yeah. Just before warned, when you open the PDF, it'll look like it's like over 200 pages, but most of that is transcripts of interviews, and it's about 85, 90 pages of reading. So, well, now, Other questions from this wonderful audience? All right. Well, again, Kaylee, thank you so much. And thank all of you who've come in today with your questions, <laughs> with your interest. And um, again, a big thank you to Hazel Tyne for helping underwrite our lecture series. And that actually leads me to just a, a brief announcement of what the Historical Society is offering next. We're very happy to uh, give a brief preview of Carl Abbott, who will be coming in a couple of weeks to talk about Sarasota's architecture. We'll he briefly hear that uh, clip to whet your appetite. On March the 9th, that's a Tuesday at 2 p.m., we'll have a Zoom talk, and I look forward to having you join us. In the 1940s and 1950s, a group of very talented architects in Sarasota, near here, started working in a whole new way in terms of architecture. 
their architecture became almost notorious. It was so widely shown all around America. And then out of this group, a man named Paul Rudolph, who's of the most important, the most known of this group, became the chairman of the School of Architecture at Yale. And from there, the Sarasota School of Architecture became one of the most important architectural forces in the world. And today, some of the most important buildings you're seeing around the world are done by students of Paul Rudolph at Yale. And Rudolph came directly from Sarasota. In my, in my discussion with you, I would like to talk about the process, the way in which this really happened in Sarasota, little Sarasota in the 40s, and how it became really a world force and one of the, the dominant forces in the world today of architecture. And it's quite remarkable. Things like this seem to have happened in history with jazz at a certain time in St. Louis and New Orleans, and a group of people just happened to be in the same place at the same time, and out of this happened something kind of mirac miraculous. So it is quite hard to believe that all this happened, and basically starting with photographs of residential work that these architects were doing. They got national attention, and then by Rudolph going to Yale, she was there for a number of years, it became international and again influenced the world. We would like to thank our members for making this possible and invite you to come join the society. Our motto, bringing history to life by collecting, documenting and archiving island history and sharing it with our community is really part and parcel of what leads all of us volunteers to passionately bring history to life, as we say. And we are dependent upon contributions. We are happy to bring this to you today and hope that you can get involved in one way or another to really keep us going with all of our activities. And research questions or book purchases can be done by phone or email and exhibits are open by appointment. Masks and social distancing guidelines are being observed. And you may also visit the History Center website, bocagrandhistoricalsociety.com. Don't hesitate to join us. From all of us at the Society, we thank you and have a good afternoon. And Kaylee, thank you again. Thank you.